Okay, good morning colleagues and thank you very much. And uh, thank you to our conference organizers. So I'm presenting to you a, a new BA degree program experience for Catholic University undergraduate students, a case study of the Department of Development Studies at St. Joseph Theological Institute here in South Africa. Um, the background is basically about looking at Catholic University as a concept and St. Joseph being the, the study case and uh, the students being the ones that were research respondents. So drawing from a Newmanian um, thinking of Catholic University, the, uh, they define that it involves producing a deep sense of Catholic and Catholicism. The methods of learning and teaching are rooted in differentiating from public universities through the unbreakable union between philosophy and religion or theology to the essence of Catholic higher education. So Catholic University is therefore a vocation of the church in the higher education ministry, which is a tradition of not involving or engaging students in matters of new programs development or rolling out and, 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 and curriculum enhancement. So St. Joseph as the case, it is um, a Catholic higher education institution here in South Africa offering the seminary type of undergraduate uh, degree programs registered with the uh, South African Department of Higher Education and Training since 2003. It is, it is a private uh, higher education institution, so to speak, and it is located in Sidara area just outside Pietermaritzburg here in KZN in South Africa. And it's solidly rooted in the Catholic higher education tradition, so to speak. So the nature of students in Catholic higher education institutions overall or in general is predominantly those people that are trained towards ordained or non-ordained uh, ministry or put it, putting it differently, societal services linked to the church leadership within the Catholic church. So for students, academics and support staff members, uh, St. Joseph Theological Institute operates as a home and a compact cross-cultural community. In, in 2013, uh, as SJTI opened doors to a more diverse student cohort uh, beyond those that are trained towards ministry in the church. Um, then the Development Studies Department was created, to which was more a departure from the philosophy and the theology uh, route uh, to offer a multidisciplinary academic programs, uh, starting with the certificate level programs. In 2019, then SJTI and its Department for, for Development Studies then uh, were accredited to offer a new multidisciplinary undergraduate degree program, the Bachelor of Arts in Human and Social Development. This program started uh, first student enrollment in February 2020 with 17 students. But then in March 2020 came COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns so another change and shift was immediately forced to, to, to the institution that has a tradition of face-to-face -face and contact uh, teaching to uh, remote and online teaching. So from a management point of view of the department, there was a need to, to really understand and measure how students have experienced this new program amidst the COVID-19 uh, challenges. So it, it really was a question that really originated from a management question to sort of like try to really understand has the program made any impact on the students um, and how it, given what the student may have actually experienced 
in the last one year. So in essence, um, Catholic university discourses hardly show any research interest uh, dedicated to the investigation of the character and role students play in interacting with the offering of new degree programs, especially for the Catholic higher education institutions here in Southern Africa. Uh, new undergraduate programs are created and rolled out with no studies to inform of the character of undergraduate students' impressions of the program that can also inform uh, curriculum enhancement. So looking at the, the literature that is available regarding the, 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 the undergraduate programs and students, firstly, it is the lecturers' interactions with the students and there is there are studies that are, are exploring that area and they establish that there is need to establish uh, practices and tools that facilitate this interaction towards a more developmental uh, 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 level of the students as well as contributing to the uh, program that the students will be involved in. Then another area that is very uh, uh, prevalent is the changes, is about the changes, studies on the changes to student induction beyond academic activities. The, 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 the central issues being the looking at the changes around the populations, student populations, the needs, the support and influences that shape the new undergraduate students' experiences and their lifestyle, so to speak. And the, 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 the voices are saying that a major contributor and ingredient to effective independent undergraduate st uh, studying and students experience is good preparation for studies in higher education and the institutional efforts also should be towards providing opportunities for student engagement. And then we also look and see the, the, the studies on the views of students regarding the quality and relevance, the origins and successes and challenges uh, in the programs. The teaching and learning processes must be must designed to stimulate discussions, motivate students, and to develop innovative ideas does to make sure that there is interactive, there is active, and there is learner-centered approaches in the programs. Also, um, it's another area which is very prevalent is about multiple stakeholder building collaboration in undergraduate education and development and the interdisciplinary knowledge uh, undergraduate students think they should possess in order to understand what they are being taught or what they are learning. Provide, this, this mainly is about providing high quality support where students across academic and non-academic spheres in, the, in their first year requires the input and cooperation of a wide range of teams of staff, be it academic staff or the, 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 the support staff. So if literature is giving us this kind of picture regarding this, the, 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 the character and involvement of undergraduate programs, we really see that maybe at St. Joseph, this was very important to really have a, a, a survey that would allow us to really have a clear picture as to what 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 do we see? What do we get from uh, our students that have been in the first in this new program? So the methodology that we used is was a more quantitative, and the data was collected using the Savvy Monkey platform uh, from seventeen uh, Saint Joseph theological students uh, that were enrolled in the new BA program in development studies since February twenty twenty into the uh, end of semester one of academic year 2021. So a survey was run for a week and then it was closed. So we did a, dis a descriptive statistical analysis um, and, and these are the results. So um, I'm not gonna go on, uh, I'm just gonna go into a quick uh, uh, um, descriptive analysis in the next slide. But as you can see in this picture here, 
the, 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 the gray is about communication and the BA modules is the, or the yellowish orange, and then the blue is about the, 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 the BA program. So um, is in the, is starting with the BA program itself, you can see it was really 100% in terms of what the students said. And then in terms of the, the, the BA modules, we've got about 53.8. And in terms of communication, uh, 76.9, which means the students, this is about students' positive impression in terms of what what they have experienced in this new program but also it doesn't account that there is there is no uh, negative impression or in in terms of what they experience so communication is uh, negative impression was about 23.1 percent and could also be a modules about 46.2 percent so in terms of the 100% of the respondents finding the BA program to be interesting and also increasing their academic efforts and acceptable high standard of teaching, the modules, are, they found the modules to, in the programs to be very insightful and also the teaching methods to be very effective and to be helping them to understand the course content. The 38 point uh, the 53.8 percent of the respondents find the modules to be a, a little bit uh, sorry there is a type error there to be a little bit acceptable uh, amount of to have a, 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 an, an, a, an acceptable amount of work and then 46.2 of the respondents found that the 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 the, the, the amount of work is uh, unacceptable so that there was a, a, a type error on the two there. Then in terms of the 76.9% of the respondents find they are, they, they are able to communicate with the lecturers regarding the issues that are very specific to their modules. And also 23.1% of the respondents find that they are not able to communicate with lecturers regarding issues specific to the modules. Another 76.9% says that the online campus academic life is enjoyable, is meaningful and relevant. But 23.1% of, of that on that response says that campus life, on life, on, on campus life, academic life was not enjoyable and meaningful and also not, they didn't find it relevant. So Two in terms of left. Sorry, say. We have two minutes left. Oh, okay. So, in terms of the overall uh, uh, experience, is that the new BA program is relevant because it has acceptable high standard of teaching, acceptable module workloads, and effective student lecture communication and interaction, and also enjoyable uh, campus life, on campus life, and peer support. Um, then also relevant and meaningful on campus life. But there are blind spots that student also raises. The amount of workloads in some of the modules needs to be looked into. The student lecturer communication in some modules on specific teaching issues. Also considering on life, uh, on, uh, on campus academic life relevance and meaningfulness for independent students. Also, students offer some suggestions with regards to the program, saying that student assemblies to, are needed to address issues that instill academic benefits to students in the program. Also, that the SJTI need to look into investigation, investigating some academic hindrances to uh, student academic performance and reasons behind hindrances, uh, behind some of the disturbances in some of the modules. Um, then also, the, I just want to go to the last bullet, a strategy to help address student uh, rapport and support in the new program is also suggested as very important, something that is needed. 
So in conclusion, then the the there is a, this is an uh, an embryo, uh, embryonic study on the Catholic higher education institutions in Southern Africa, because there are no other studies that I found that have really focused on this sector of private higher education in South Africa specifically. Drawing from literature, the need to establish practices and tools that facilitate students' interaction and involvement towards a developmental of a new program or a new degree program is important. For Catholic university discourses, the character and role of students play uh, in, in interacting with the offering of a new program remains a need. Engaging the undergraduate students' perceptions add value and learning about the areas where uh, the CHEI management views, views of the degree program is obstructed either by the traditional culture or methods of managing learning and teaching. So this embryonic study demonstrates that it matters uh, for a new degree program development, uh, rolling out and also curriculum enhancement. And it is important to engage the undergraduate students so that all creativity and innovation can sustain the program and also that the program blind spots can be dealt with early in before uh, you continue making uh, mistakes. Thank you very much. I welcome some questions and suggestions to improve the paper. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Prof. Adish Badri. Um, I'm from the Information Systems Department at uh, University of Cape Town, situated in the School of uh, Information Technology. Uh, my colleague and co-writer on this uh, paper is Prof. Harsha Cathard. Um, she heads up the Inclusive Practice of Africa group, and it's part of the Division of Communication Sciences um, and Disorders, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Department of Health and Rehab, Rehab uh, Sciences, also at UCT. So the paper that I'm going to be talking about today is a work in progress. It's called Inclusive Software Development, a Case Study of uh, Inclusive Practices Africa. So I'll step through it a little bit and please um, stop me if there's any questions or I think the, pro the procedure would be uh, questions afterwards. But please make notes of them because we, as I said, it is a work in progress. So it's something that we'd really appreciate some feedback on. So in terms of the background, <clears throat> what we discussed, as you can see, um, and the previous speaker spoke a lot around interdisciplinary, and that's exactly what, try, what we're trying to promote here, where we looked at the software dis development process and technology design. <clears throat> and what we realized is that it normally uses ableism as a base. Now, what do we mean when we say ableism is, uh, we did not take into account, um, you know, the concept of othering has become so, so rife nowadays, the whole discussion of who are these others um, and what do we base as normal? So who, you, who do you define as normal and who's not? Um, how do you take into account people with disabilities? How do you take into account just people who are different? And unfortunately, especially in the technology design space, uh, we normally look at, at uh, others as an afterthought. So it's normally the sort of normal that we define and we base our design of that. Where true inclusion uh, keeps the entire village in mind, it's not just individuals. So the question that needs to be asked is, um, how is the entire population going to benefit from this, not just a select group? So from a practical perspective, um, the emphasis around uh, inclusion from the very get-go. So what do we talk about when we, um, when we, when we or rather, what do we mean when we talk about the get-go? Um, and we went all the way back to, well, what are we actually teaching our students? Um, what is the curriculum based on? And very much that curriculum is based on ableism. So how do we then start looking at inclusive design and how do we address both social and functional factors 
all the way from the very beginning, right? And then within the curriculum sort of redesign that we will discuss now, um, how do we actually provide students with appropriate tools to encourage that interrogation of social factors um, during the inclusive technology design? Now, this is something that Prof. Cathard and I have been looking at for a little while. Um, and this was the very practical case that we've now taken into um, taken and looked at. So a bit of background around Inclusive Practices in Africa. Um, it is a project that was formed in between 2019 and 2020. And it is part of uh, strengthening, strengthening inclusion at UCT with the primary objective being to reduce social inequality caused by disability. Um, part of the project was that a website was established and the challenge came up of, okay, but you know, we're talking about inclusion, but how do we actually make the project website more inclusive? And then from there you go, well, is it good enough to just have a standalone website? Um, what about an inclusive information portal that is available to a range of stakeholders. Because when we talk about people with disabilities, and when I, when I talk about disabilities, we talk about physical disabilities, we talk about learning disabilities, um, you know, there's, there's quite a wide range, but there's a lot of stakeholders involved. It's not just the individual with the disability, it's, it's caregivers, it's family members, it's the community at large. So how do you actually make information available to this entire range of stakeholders. Now, in parallel, um, part of the information systems uh, department third year curriculum um, is a software development project. So it's a year long project where students have to actually um, do the requirements gathering, um, draw up the actual design and then actually develop um, a piece of software. And this is normally based on the requirements of a project sponsor. So we decided to actually include students so that we could, we could observe and, and create a practice-based project. Um, so IPA uh, or the IPA project became the project sponsor and, um, and the students then uh, were able to interact not only with IPA team members, but, but also people with disabilities to understand what are the requirements of this information portal. So it became a classroom of learning where it addressed real world problems um, of marginalization and inequality across a number of disciplines. And it really gave the opportunity to engage with various stakeholders um, and role players. So the method that we followed um, the project was conducted by five students, uh, and like I said, to update the existing IPA student uh, website, sorry, um, to a fully functional information portal. Now, the research is very qualitative in nature, um, and it's about assessing the ongoing feedback during the development process. Um, so how do we actually collect the data? Um, a lot of it is observational. Um, but there's a lot of discussion, um, so direct questioning as well as indirect questioning to the students, um, as well as reflection. So the students reflect, and to give you an example of the type of um, discussions that we've had, we started off the project by asking the students, they were allowed to choose which project they'd like to work on, and every one of them had a pers very personal reason as to why they chose a project um, that, that uh, spoke to inclusivity for them. And then as we progressed through the year, they were, they reflected at different touch points to actually go, okay, so this is what I've actually learned. This is what I've actually understood. This has become so much clearer to me. So just in terms of some pre preliminary findings, um, so students have actually reflected on ableism generally where they actually didn't realize how focused uh, the ent their entire curriculum, but also the way that they were thinking um, is always, always focused on ableism. Um, so for us, it's about challenging that uh, information systems as well as computer science educational practice by using critical re reflection um, as an opportunity to actually look at, well, what's, what's actually important here? 
and especially for information systems. For me, I've always looked at information systems, uh, part of, or a huge chunk of it as being a, a social science, because we look at um, the human impact, the technolo technology's impact on that human. Um, so we have to look, critically look at, okay, but uh, how do we actually use these opportunities to, to be much more inclusive, especially when we talk about curriculum redesign? Um, so examples that we found specific to the project were interviewing people with disabilities in learning and actually seeing the value of transdisciplinary first, but also decolonial engagement. So where to from here? Um, so we're busy with the triangulation of the different data points. As I said, there were quite a few data points that we used, um, the discussions, observations, reflection, et cetera. And we'd like to then do a thematic analysis of those findings. Um, but what we're really seeing uh, from, from sort of anecdotal information from the students is that there is a mind shift required uh, to bring exclusivity into the development process very early on. And this is where we talk about curriculum evolution. So the curriculum, when it comes to software design, software development, is very much based on ableism. Uh, and there's the whole uh, history behind that. Uh, hence the, the decoloniality um, perspective when we're re-looking at the curriculum. And not necessarily just killing the curriculum and, and starting a new one, it's about evolving it. Um, so that you get that wider view of requirements that's not just limited to able-bodied individuals. Okay, sweet and short, that's me. A um, couple of selected references. As I said, we have looked at, um, we have started looking at this really since the kickoff of IPA. Um, so, so it is something that's ongoing. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um... Unfortunately, Cindy is not able to join us today. Um, so I'll be presenting alone, but she's definitely here <laughs> with us in spirit. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, and let's, based on the title, you can see that we're really going to talk about um, what we experienced as, as academics in the higher education space. I don't think it's necessarily different to what teachers uh, experience in schools. Um, so um, I think um, I, I predict that they, all of us on this, um, when we go through the slides and especially look at the findings, there will be something that you may um, be able to relate to. Um, so very quickly, I'll, it's, a, it's a really quick background and method, and then I'm going to focus much more on the findings, which I think is, is the meat of, of our study. Right, so um, obviously in March, we know, and, and just bear with me and pretend a little bit that, that um, you don't know and <laughs> that you weren't part of it, but we certainly were. We were all still fine and, and moving along quite nicely in the beginning of 2022. And then in March, um, March 11th to be exact, um, WHO declared um, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. What that meant was that in um, South Africa on March 27th, uh, specifically, we went into um, the hard, what we call the hard lockdown restrictions. The levels came afterwards, but we know now that it was considered um, the hard lockdown restrictions. And what this meant was that um, for all of us, it was just, it was this physical, psychological and social shift um, in every aspect. It dropped us to the core. It really... Um, Every, our foundation was completely disrupted. And, and the nature of, of that transition was because it was so sudden, it was so drastic, it was so abrupt. Um, a lot of the um, participants in the study will um, report to us about that shift and that, um, that abrupt shift that really um, uh, impacted them psychologically. And as academics, uh, so we know that we shifted and we had to make all these changes in our social life. Um, and of course, the fear of this disease that we, we didn't understand. But as academics, there were two big things that we had to grapple with. And the one was this emergency uh, shift to, uh, the, to 
transition from face to face to contact to sorry to online distance teaching. So it was this emergency shift and it was a remote teaching as well. So there was this, the social distancing was felt in all aspects. And a lot of the academics were really um, trying to make the shift uh, in silos and they were very, very um, isolated. And then the other key thing that the study um, presented and showed up was the, the challenges of working from home. And so those are the two things that, that we really focused on. So the aim of the study in the rationale was really, given the COVID context and the pandemic um, and the continuing after effects thereof, we are still in the pandemic. I know sometimes we feel like um, we don't want to be, or we want this thing to be over. And then we get um, announcements like last, uh, last week, um, a week from to be exact, that reminds us that we fall from, from out of this pandemic. And so we wanted to explore and understand what, what was the psychological impact of the COVID-19 on our academics and higher education. And we looked at academics in higher um, public and as well as private. So the method, just briefly, the method we used was qualitative. We had um, 11 full-time academics employed at higher education institutions. Um, it was mainly from Western Cape Gauteng. Um, and the disciplines that we covered were psychology, IT, commerce, optometry, and law. So we had a nice range and a nice diverse group of, of academics. Participants were recruited via um, LinkedIn. Uh, we used purpose of sampling. Uh, we used it initially, and when we struggled, we moved on to, to snowball sampling. And the instrument was the semi-structured interview guide comprising seven questions. And the data analysis we used was thematic analysis. So let's talk about the findings. And we've got a, got a few themes. We've uh, divided our findings into a few themes. So the impact of lockdown restrictions. And we asked them initially, what was, what was your initial reaction to the announcement of the lockdown and to the restrictions of the pandemic. And it was actually quite mixed emotions. So many of them said that there was initial stress and anxiety because of this fear of this unknown, this pandemic. We've never ever lived through a pandemic. We've never, any of us have never been through this kind of hard lockdown measures. There was the worry of their personal well being and that of their life loved ones and we've put some quotes in um in the I may have time to read through or I may not you can read through them on your own while I've got it up on the screen. But if you look at some of the words they use and what what we found that um uh, the words that the, the words that the participants use were quite key into the, the profound nature of what they were feeling. So words like daunting, horror, shock, anxiety. Um, some of the mixed emotions some people announced or, or reported that they, at first it was, um, they weren't actually that stressed about it. Because if you remember initially, it was a 21 day lockdown. And for some people it was, well, you know, this is a nice time for me, um, maybe to spend some time at home. I don't need to sit in traffic anymore. Um, this, is, this is quite a cool thing. Um, people had to wear masks, they had to go and do all the shopping. There was this, there was this panic buying, you remember it was um, all kinds of, you know, you bought food for three days and you ate it up in three hours type of thing. Um, so there was this mixed emotion. So not everyone um, was initially felt the, the stress in the body. It was generally once we realized that this 21 days was not going to be 21 days. It was really going to last longer. And I mean, right now we, we enjoy our 600 and odd day. Um, it's, it's when that realization came that mm -mm, this thing is not going away soon. That's when the the stress and anxiety really started to, to kick in. But a lot of them said that they were also, they didn't stress necessarily because they were so in this mode of, I need to help my students, I need to figure out how to move on to the online space. They reported that there was a lot of difficulty with switching off, um, that, uh, and especially those who um, have to also be um, educators for their own children at home. Uh, work from home was really particularly difficult. There was um, this participant here said found it difficult to switch off because your home is your office. You know, and now people talk about, do you work from home or do you live at work? So that kind of blurry lines really became a thing. Boundaries was very difficult to maintain from 
um, from students or even colleagues or even meetings going on to well into the night. Um, and they just felt that everyone just kind of wanted a piece of them. And this caused constant fatigue. This cons the consequence of the blurring of the lines was constant fatigue. Uh, this is still theme one continued. What a lot of our participants uh, reported was a sense of guilt. Guilt in not spending enough quality time with family. Guilt, um, you know, this this am I the guilt of I'm not doing enough? Do my many my, do my line managers know that I'm working hard, or do they think that I'm I'm skiving off because they can't see me? That that sense of you know if you're not at work. Um, from eight to five, then people think you're not working. Uh, the guilt of not spending um, time with people that they can't see, uh, especially if they had parents who depended on them. And there was just, there was a lot of guilt wrapped up into the, the concept of, I can't give of myself. I can't give up enough of myself to my family. I can't give enough of myself uh, to, my, to my students and to my colleagues. And what was interesting that we noticed that was um, that there was a lot of guilt about giving to others and not as much thought about um, who's taking care of them, who's taking care of us while we're busy taking care of others. For some, one or two of our participants, they, they tended to self-diagnose. They claimed to be suffering from depression. Um, they did not have a formal diagnosis. Um, and so I guess what they were, what, what they were feeling was this, sense of anxiety and just feeling down. Um, they had empathy. The empathy they said that they had initially, and this was an interesting finding, that the empathy that they said they had initially for students started to diminish uh, towards the end of 2020, and it started to diminish even in 2021. And that empathy they said that diminished because of the mental exhaustion. They use words like mental exhaustion, emotionally fatigue, burnt out, um, words like just can't anymore, I've, I've got nothing to give. Okay. Um, so that was quite an interesting finding, something that we didn't think that we would find. There were some that said there were no negative impact, they, they experienced no negative psychological impact or emotional impact. Um, they found that during 2020 and now still in 2021, they're quite resilient. Um, they found that what this pandemic and, and the ensuing consequences of it, they realize that they can cope with anything, that they're able to deal with new challenges, and they've actually grown because of it. And they found that they didn't realize that they could adapt in the way that they did. They didn't realize that they had it in them. And this participant's quote here says that it was a real big boost to their confidence. So that was really positive. In theme two, um, the impact of changes to the teaching and learning environment, there were many, like I spoke about earlier, the move from this predominantly face-to-face. -face. Now, bearing in mind that some of the participants, um, a few of them had some online teaching uh, pre-COVID, um, but the majority of our academics did not. So it was a real change for them. They spoke about emotional isolation and a few, two of them spoke about um, two to three spoke specifically about the fact that they felt they weren't supported from their institutions in terms of change management and there were some unrealistic expectations um, that were placed on them and they felt uh, uh, in some cases a lack of regard for their personal well-being that they were just expected to do without any um, thought about what this, um, how this impacted them. They continued to speak about this panic and hype heightened sense of anxiety um, from 2020. They used words like it was a rough year, a very traumatic year. And this, this panic and anxiety and heightened feeling continues with every wave that, that comes because many of them lost loved ones. Um, many of them lost uh, people, spouses who lost finances. So there was a lot of, of emotions to deal with. Um, the impact also was this navigation of, of the technology and the learning management systems. Um, some of them use the institutions and use Moodle, some of them use uh, Blackboard, they have different management systems. And, that, and it's interesting that a lot of them said, we, we always had this platform available to us, but we never used it in the way that we use it in 2020. 
Um, and so that was quite dramatic for them. Right in the beginning, some of them said we had to upload videos and we had to create all these um, resources for students. And it would take us um, up to eight to 10 hours just to create um, um, a video of 20 minutes. So that transition and that navigation of, of the technology was really stressful for them. And of course, the adaptation also left some of them feeling really ill-prepared and anxious. And what we didn't put down here was um, because for this particular presentation, we didn't focus on, um, but just interesting to mention that for some of them, they said it, it really rocked their um, sense of um, identity as a lecturer. I need to move here so the light can come on, sorry. I'm in a, in a room where the light went off, so I hope you can still see me. Um, and this increased workload that they also um, experienced. They used words like, it just broke me and the admin. Um, behind was insane. Now they go on, they moved on to speak about um, the emotional fatigue that they feel. And they said that there was no real demarcation between 2020 and 2021. So quite a few of them reported that they felt that um, maybe at the end of 2020, this 2021 will be um, something that they could look forward to. And then, you know, there was a sense of, Maybe at the end of a calendar year, we'll see light and we'll see light at the end of the tunnel and we'll start a new academic year and the, maybe the pandemic will be gone and they realize, no, that, that definitely was not it. In fact, some of them reported that 2021 felt a little bit more challenging than 2020. And again, there was no real switch off. So it's like, you know, um, 23 months now of 2020. Um, they spoke about institutional denial. This is a term that they use, um, some of them in what had occurred in 2020 and they said, well, our institution- got minutes to go. Oh, one minute, sorry. Our institution didn't really focus on or take the lessons learned from 2020 and then um, uh, help us navigate 2021. Okay, so since I've got a minute, I'm just gonna move quickly through, sorry, that just, and then this feeling of helplessness. Some of the coping me me mechanisms, I won't read through all, but, uh, it was faith, it was physical activity, it was undertaking personal studies um, and lots of exercise. And some of them said acceptance of reality and adaptability. So in conclusion, we, we found that emotional psychological responses plus a deep concern for self and others and increased workload has really led to our academic um, teams in many institutions feeling really emotionally fatigued. And just some reflections that um, the emotional exhaustion as a result of the overlap continues, that we hope that institutions can create safe spaces for academics to reflect on the experiences and going forward to always be aware of the mental health of our academics. Thank you very much.